Well, if you have your copy of God's perfect and holy word, I invite you to open it up to the first letter of John, chapter 5. The first letter of John, chapter 5. We have been uh, going through the letter of First John for quite some time now. In fact, this is the, the 11th message from this letter, and today is going to mark the conclusion of what we've been going through. And though it, it's really only a short letter, it just takes a few minutes to read all the way through. It's chock full of wisdom and counsel and, and theology. And as a way of review, uh, John is an apostle of Jesus Christ. And what that means is that John was one of the, the closest uh, confidants that Jesus had when he was here on earth. He outlived most of the other, well, he outlived all the other apostles by uh, a little more than 30 years. All the other apostles, by the time John had written this letter, had all been killed for their faith. But yet John is still alive, and it's not for, uh, it's not for lack of them trying. They did indeed try to kill John many times, and he survived every attempt. And so when they could no longer kill him, the only thing that they found that they could do was get rid of him. So they exiled him to an island called Patmos, and that is where he, is. he, he remained the rest of his life. And prior to this exile, he was pastoring the church at Ephesus. It was a, a church that the Apostle Paul had planted, and by all means, it was the mega church of its day. Uh, it wasn't too long after John's exile, however, that problems began to arise within the church. And these were problems that did not come from outside influences, but rather problems that were born from the inside of the church. False teachers had made their way up the ladder of leadership and began to introduce teaching and doctrine that was contrary to what Paul and what John had, had, had brought to them. And most of it had to do with the person and work of Jesus Christ. And whether or not he was born God or whether or not he became God through uh, certain events that uh, may have happened. And the implications of this teaching ravaged the church. Divisions were created and the church ended up splitting. Those that fell prey to the false teaching, they left the church along with those teachers to go and start another uh, group within the community. Those that stayed at the church in Ephesus were severely wounded relationships had been broken. People were questioning not only their faith, but, but questioning God and his goodness. And, and, and as would be expected, uh, instead of thriving, this was a church that somehow started uh, turning on themselves and began treating each other with contempt rather than benevolence. Now, such situations are not unique to the church of Ephesus. Church conflict is, unfortunately, very common occurrence in many churches. Added to that, there doesn't seem to be a week that goes by when I don't read a news article from somewhere about a pastor or a church leader that fell into, the, into moral sin and had to either resign or was forced out of their ministry. And the results for the church are absolutely devastating. At best, people are hurt and confused and walk with a spiritual limp. At worst, People just give up on the church altogether and either abandon Christianity or decide that they can go at it alone. And so John writes this letter to a hurting people. And he writes this letter to a hurting church. And he goes back to the basics of faith and reassures his readers in those basics. 
He, were, he, were, he has reminded us of the simple goodness of the gospel, of who Jesus Christ is, who he was, what he has done for us, and what he is doing for us now. He has reminded us of how we can know Christ rightly and find the deep, deep love of God in Jesus Christ. He has taught us then, because of that, how we can truly love and how we can truly live. He has helped us see the seriousness of sin, but he has also helped us to see how it is that we can avoid it. He has strengthened the weakened knees of faith, and he's helped us to to stand on solid ground of overcoming sin and opposition, and he has warned us of the dangers that the world presents to us. And in today's passage, he's going to close out his letter by, by throwing together what, what seems like a hodgepodge of ideas, but yet there's a unifying idea that, that John has, this unifying idea that is weaved throughout it. And it's the same theme that he has weaved through this text again and again and again, which tells us that is something that we continually need to be reminded of. And that is one of assurance. One of assurance. It is one of confidence. And I believe that based on this letter, that God wants us to be confident Christians. God wants us to be confident in prayer. God wants you and I to be confident in his ability to restore us as well as protect us. And I believe that God wants you to be confident about the truth that is in Jesus Christ. So let's look at our passage together, and then we'll see what it is that God has for us this morning. Let's look in our Bibles in 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 13. This is what the Apostle John writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I I, I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Let's pray. Father, would you... Help us to see the glory of Christ Jesus this morning and where we might be weak. Would you give us confidence so that we can stand on firm ground on the solid rock of Jesus Christ? And it's in his name that I ask this. Amen. So wherever we are in our walk with Christ, whether we're hurting or whether we're healing or whatever we're at, God wants us to be confident. And I believe in this text, he wants us to be confident in three ways. The first is that we ought to be confident in prayer. Be confident in prayer. In verse 13, John states his overall purpose in writing this entire letter. Read along with me in verse 13. I write these things to you who believe... 
in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, that's a, that's a pretty bold statement. We can know for certain that we have eternal life, that we are saved, that we have our sins removed from us, and that we are living free if we believe in Jesus Christ. And it's just not a belief that, that's, that's like a child believing in the Easter bunny or Santa Claus. This belief is better thought of as a deep, abiding trust in Christ Jesus. It is an assurance that uh, not only are we saved, but there is nothing on this earth or even in hell or in uh, anywhere else that can change the status of God's disposition toward us in Jesus Christ. And that is good news for us. Because we can be certain that we have eternal life, John tells us then that we can have confidence that we have VIP, backstage access to God through prayer. Look in verse 14 with me. And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So, in other words, we have a, a, a God who not only secures us in Christ, but He also hears us in Christ. You know, I, I tell my children all the time that there is a difference between hearing and listening. You can hear and you can comprehend the words that I'm saying, but unless it moves into action, it's not listening. And the word that John uses here that says that God hears, it is the word that literally means to listen favorably. And when you think about that with God and prayer, that He listens favorably to us, well, that's a bit of assurance. It, it means that God not only hears and understands, but He likes what He hears, and He acts on what He hears. You know, a lot of people question God and they question prayer when they don't seem to think that God is answering their prayers. In such time of doubt, we need to make sure that we are living correctly, believing correctly, and also reading correctly. Let's look at those, those three. Earlier in the letter, John has told us that as believers, we need to be practicing righteousness. Now, we don't, we don't practice righteousness, we don't practice goodness in order for God to see how good we are and how amazing we are and then all of a sudden look favorably upon us. Rather, we act righteously, we do good because of the response for what God has already done for us in Christ Jesus. So if we're thinking that God isn't hearing our prayers, the first thing we should ask ourselves is, is there any unrepentant sin in my life? Am I harboring a secret or fallen into patterns that are not biblical that I need to change, that are not pleasing to God? And if that checks out and that seems okay, then we need to ask, are we believing the right things about God? Do we see God uh, rightly? Do we see God as the sovereign creator of the universe? Or do we rather see God as a vending machine that is just waiting for our quarter to pop in and then he will just give us whatever we dial on that little board? Does our theology line up with what we read on the pages? Which leads us to another question. Am I reading the Word rightly? Look in verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Notice what John doesn't say here. He doesn't say that if you ask anything, 
that he is going to give it to us and that he will hear. But he says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears and he answers. So what we need to do is continually be trying to turn the dial of our heart to the frequency that God is residing in. Get to a point where our heart is beating in the same rhythm as God's, and that we're in tune with what He wants, His, His ways, His thoughts, His actions. You now, pastor and author Tim Keller said it this way, and I love it. He said, God will either give us what we ask or give us what we would have asked if we know everything that He knows. That's quite a profound statement. We can never know everything that God knows, so the best that we can settle for is to tune our hearts rightly with God. Now, look at how he links verse 14 to 15 now. And we know that he hears us in whatever we ask. We know that we have the request that we asked of him. So, when we ask according to his will, you and I can assume that it's ours. We can assume that when we are abiding in God and we're asking things that are pleasing to Him, asking things that are, that are part of His, His divine idea, that it's ours. The thing is, we might not see it immediately. We might not see the results. It might take a while, but we can be confident that it is ours. But again, I don't want us to be disillusioned and think that God will just grant us whatever it is that we ask. It has to be in His will. And whether we're good intentioned or not, many times our will and our desire is the very opposite of what God is desiring for us. In Christian circles, we, we often talk about the power of prayer. Uh, there's a whole series of books on the power of prayer, and, and I think that that term, the power of prayer, is slightly misleading. Uh, even in this sermon point, uh, this be confident in prayer, it can be misleading. Our confidence is not so much in prayer itself, but our confidence rather is in the God of prayer. It is in the God who hears. It is in the God who listens. It is in the God who acts. And Paul Miller, in his phenomenal book, A Praying Life, he wrote this. He said, many people struggle to learn how to pray because they're focusing on praying, not on God. Making prayer the center is like making conversation the center of a family mealtime. In prayer, focusing on the conversation is like trying to drive while looking through the windshield instead of looking, looking at the windshield rather than looking through it. It freezes us, making us unsure of where to go. Conversation is only the vehicle through which we can experience one another, and prayer is getting to know a person, a God who is at the center so we need to be confident in prayer, but not in prayer itself, but in the God of prayer. And that leads us to our second point, which is be confident in God's restoration and protection. Be confident in God's restoration and protection. You know, one of the things that I love about the letter of 1 John is that there's this, this dichotomy that he has of being very idealistic, but then at the same time being realistic. Uh, for example, in chapter 2, verse 1, he writes, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. You look at that, and that's ideal, that we may not sin. But now look at how he deals with realistically here. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So ideally, as Christians, 
we would never sin again. Wouldn't life be great if we just never sinned again? But realistically speaking, though we've been redeemed from the curse of sin, we still sin every single day. And, and part of our struggle with sin is that we either don't see it in ourselves, we try to ignore it, maybe try to hide it, or we deny it. But God has established this, this amazing community called the church in which one of the functions of the church is to love each other in such a way that we get to, and that's the word I use, we get to pray for one another. And we get to uh, work with each other in such a way that we can help each other to not be caught in the snare of sin. And that's a very gracious function that the Lord Christ has given to us in the church. Look at verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. Okay, so obviously there's a confusing proposition here, and we'll get to that here in, in, in just a moment. But first, let's get to the main point of what John is saying here. John is telling you and me that we need to pray for each other. We need to pray for each other. Life is too difficult. Life is too messy. Life gets in the way. We need help. And one of the ways that we can have help is through prayer. Life in this world is very difficult as Christians, and I think that in years to come, it's going to continually be more and more difficult. And because we're constantly being pushed and pulled in every direction in order to conform to patterns of, of the world, we need each other. And let's be honest, Christians can sin big time. And because we profess the name of Christ, when sins come out, it seems to be a little more public than it would with someone that's part of the world. And so we need to pray for our brothers and sisters that they would avoid sin at every cost. And if they are in sin, that they would repent and return to the Lord Jesus Christ and be restored. Now, John gives us a little bit of a head-scratcher here. When he writes that we ought to pray for those who commit sins that do not lead to death. And then he, he takes it a, a little bit of a step further in verse 16. Look in verse 16 again. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. One of the most complicated verses in the entire New Testament. The other three happen to be in the same letter, I think. But we have to assume that John's audience knows exactly what he's talking about. And it seems to me that in this context, he is originally talking about people, uh, about praying for believers, uh, believers, for brothers and sisters in Christ, Christians who fall into sin. And when a truly converted person falls into a sin, though it's wrong, it does not cause them to lose their eternal security. It doesn't cause them to lose their salvation. Therefore, the sin that they do not commit does not lead to death. It does not lead to eternal death. In other words, it does not bring them to hell. On the other hand, there are folks all over that aren't redeemed. They have either rejected Christ or they've never heard of him, and they're in bondage to sin. In their case, every sin 
from the smallest little white lie to the most egregious sin that our minds can imagine is worthy of eternal judgment. Their sin leads to death. Now, here's where the really sticky part comes in. John seems to suggest that we shouldn't pray for such people. And that cuts to the heart of many of us who have friends and family and co-workers that we care about deeply, that they would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Is John saying that we shouldn't pray for them? I'm going to give you a cliffhanger and say, I really don't know. I don't know. But I think there are a couple things that we can conclude from what John is saying here. First, you would be hard-pressed to find many or any examples in the New Testament of an apostle praying for the conversion of unbelievers. You can search and search, it's just not there. You see examples of apostles asking for boldness on their part that they can evangelize boldly and efficiently. Second, John is deeply dealing with the issue of sin. And his primary concern, John's primary concern is the church and its members. So at the end of verse 16, when he says, I do not say one should pray for that, I think what John is saying is that our primary responsibility in prayer is toward our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And though we can and should pray for unbelievers, I think what John is saying here that it's not a sin if we don't. That's the best that I can come up with. And quite honestly, I'm not even 100% set on that. Um, I hold it very loosely. What I am confident in is one of God's ordained means of sinning Christians being restored is through prayer. Now notice how he takes this idea of restoration now and he turns it a bit in verse 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. So John returns to this idea, that uh, idea of Christians and, and, and sin, which he did earlier in the letter, and he's basically saying that though Christians still do sin, they're not defined by it. It doesn't have mastery over them anymore. It doesn't hold them hostage. And they don't have habits of sin. Why? Because as the Psalms encourage us over and over and over and over and over again, God protects them. That God is a shield about them. That God is a fortress, a very present help in time of need. He is a loving father who would do anything to protect his children from harm, even at the expense of harming himself, which he did in Christ Jesus. And because of that, the devil in the world has nothing on us. They can't get us. Christ has already won and we can be confident in God's ability to keep us from harmful effects of sin by staying our hand on whatever it is that our tendencies or even the devil would have us do. And that's encouraging. So we need to be confident in prayer. We need to be confident in God's ability to restore us and protect us. And finally, 
we need to be confident in the truth of Jesus Christ. Be confident in the truth of Jesus Christ. In many ways, this letter as a whole is a call to know Christ rightly and reject all false claims. In a 2000 research study that was done by Ligonier Ministries and Lifeway, they found that 53% of the general American population believes that Jesus is the first and greatest uh, creature created by God. 13% said they weren't sure. Now, John has labored throughout this letter to tell us that Jesus was never created, that he was eternally existing with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, we could say that if 53% of the American population uh, believes that, well, we don't, it's probably not part of the church we can expect that the world would not hold the same understanding of Christ that we do in our Bibles. But within that study, they found that 71% of evangelicals believe the same thing. 71% of evangelicals, 7 out of 10, they found, believed that Christ was created. This added to the fact that when they only looked at evangelicals, only 60% agreed that the Bible is the highest authority for what they believe. Four out of ten evangelical Christians don't believe in the trustworthiness of the Bible. Only 52% of evangelicals say that they agree that personal evangelism is important. And get this, only 60% of evangelicals believe that Jesus' death on the cross is the only sacrifice that can remove the penalty of sin. It's that 40% of people in evangelical churches do not hold to the exclusivity of Jesus Christ to save us from our sin. Only 51% believe that that those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior receive the free gift of eternal salvation. 51%. Friends, if these stats are true, and looking at the research methodology, it was a solid study, then we have a lot of people in our evangelical churches that don't know Jesus. And if they don't know Jesus, they're not saved. Look with me in verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding that we may know Him who is true and are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ, He is the true God and eternal life. We need to stand and be confident in who Jesus Christ is revealed in His Word. And we need to be ready to lovingly teach it or we need to be ready to stand our ground on it. John's church was divided and split over the doctrine of Christ. And in the modern church today, we look at that as if it is the greatest tragedy that a church would divide in such a way. Sometimes such division is necessary. R.C. Sproul, who is perhaps my favorite Bible teacher, theologian, he was once asked, Why should we engage in debate since it seems to cause division in the church? What message does it send to those outside the church? And this was his answer. He's a brilliant guy. God forbid that we should ever debate the truth of the gospel. 
that we should ever follow in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul who debated the matter every day in the marketplace and who wrote all these epistles to correct error and distortions of the truth of God. Weren't those the letters the Apostle wrote to the Ephesians, the Galatians, and the Colossians divisive? Nothing divides like the truth. Nothing divides like Jesus. But we have this idea that the only real sin that you can have is dividing a church. Well, there are churches that need to be divided, and they need to be divided not over minor matters, not over picadillos, but over substantive issues of the truth of God. And our Lord, when he was asked by Pontius Pilate, what are you about? He said, I came to bear witness to the truth, and those that are of the truth hear my voice. And the next thing Jesus said is, but I sure don't want to divide anyone over that truth. Obviously being a joke. The worst thing, R.C. Sproul says, the worst thing that you can do is say that truth is unimportant. When you do that, what happens then is that truth gets slain in the streets and anything goes. In the second book of J.R.R. Tolkien's series, The Lord of the Rings, the book is The Two Towers, there's this scene in which Frodo Baggins is incredibly discouraged because the journey that they're on is not going well at all. He's tired. He's exhausted. He is working on basically saving the world. And he says to his companion, Samwise Gamgee, he says, Sam, I can't do this. Have you ever felt that way? In your spiritual walk, I can't do this. Sam replies, I know. It's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here. But we are. It's like the great stories, Mr. Frodo. The ones that really mattered, full of darkness and danger they were, and sometimes you didn't know the end, because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come. When the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you, that meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folks in these stories had lots of chances of holding on to something. And Frodo asked, What are we holding on to, Sam? Sam said, that there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo. And it's worth fighting for. Brothers and sisters, that is the story of the church. A church may seem dark and gloomy, but Christ, Christ is worth fighting for. A pure church is worth dividing over. The gospel is worth dying for. So be confident in the truth concerning Jesus. You know, I've talked a lot about the church of Ephesus over these 11 weeks. But I haven't told you the end of its story. In the end... The church of Ephesus didn't make it. In the end, Christ took out their lampstand, and to this day, I, don't, I do not believe that there is a church in the city of Ephesus. But it does not have to happen here. It doesn't happen, have to happen here if we take heed of John's word. That we learn to love God and love each other. If we learn to love the truth about Christ and live him out. It doesn't have to happen 
if we take confidence in prayer and take confidence in God's restoration and His protection, and it doesn't have to take, it doesn't have to happen if we have confidence in the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. So be confident in your faith, and He will surely bless it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this is yet another difficult message. You call us to weeks like this, to hear things that are hard, to hear things that are difficult. And Lord, I pray that they would sink in. Lord, I pray that you would help us to strengthen weak knees of faith, that you would help us to walk on solid ground, that we would know that there is a faith worth living for, there is a faith worth dying for, there is a faith worth fighting for. And so, Father, would you now do that work in our midst? Would you help us to be faithful? For those that don't know Christ, Lord, I'm going to pray for those that don't know you. I'm going to pray, God, that you would open up blind eyes, that you would open up deaf ears, so that someone even today can come to know you, that as it stands, they're separated from you, but because of your great love, sending Christ on our behalf to take the punishment that we deserve, to rise from the dead to show your victory over death, and that through faith in him, we can have all the guilt, all the stain of sin removed. Would you do that, Father? And as we look to the coming weeks, Lord, as we begin to look at Psalms, would you prepare our hearts to be encouraged on how great of a God you are and how wonderful you are and how you are indeed worth living for?